Benabal Crag, May 7th, 794, by Robert Westall. The following is a previously unpublished story by the North Shields novelist Robert Westall, 1929 to 1993. It takes place in Tynemouth during a Viking raid in the 8th century and is written in a style alluding to the Anglo-Saxon chronicle. So many of us grew up captivated by the stories of Robert Westall, such as the Machine Gunners and the Watch House. As a boy from Tynemouth, these stories carried extra significance and wonder for me and my friends. For children like us, playing around Tynemouth's idyllic and endlessly curious priory, beaches and village, his stories directly fed our imaginations and quests for adventure. Given that this site is dedicated to the history of Tynemouth and shares the same esoteric name of the story, it's a privilege to be able to share it and to provide readers with the work of such a celebrated novelist while preserving publicly this hitherto unknown story for future generations. Robert Westall's works are held by the Seven Stories National Centre for Children's Books based at the Usburn in Newcastle. Many thanks go to the contributors and curators of this fantastic resource for children, including Lindy McKinnell, Michael Geary, and Georgia Glover of David Higgum Associates. Thanks also goes to the Westall Estate for granting me permission to publish this on penbal.uk. Part 1. The Lord is just. Northumbria has done evil, and Northumbria has been punished. Now we have suffered greatly. Perhaps the Lord will turn his face towards us again. Certainly he has answered our prayers, for which his name be praised. I blame myself. I saw the evil coming, and did not lift up my voice against it, for fear of the kings. Though I am prior of a great monastery, I was afraid. Now I have learned not to be afraid. Things may get better. It all began just over a year ago. On the surface, the kingdom prospered. Never had Northumbria possessed so many noble monasteries, written by so ma- written so many holy books, offered up so many masses to God. But we were a whited sepulchre. The royal family fought within itself, brother seeking to kill brother, and gained the throne. Kings had been killed by their own bodyguard, those who had sworn on holy books and relics to protect the Lord's body with their own. There was no loyalty left in the land. Too many young warriors sat idle because the farms of their birthright had been given to the church by pious fathers in exchange for the hope of salvation. The best of these youths went to hire out their swords to foreign princes overseas. The worst stayed to plot and murder. The church's farms paid no taxes to the king, so the burden fell ever more heavily on the nobles. They, to avoid tax, founded religious houses that were shams, where the Lord was not known. The young monks and nuns in them sat around all day dressed in unbecoming finery and without labour or prayer to occupy their minds. As a result, it was difficult to tell such monasteries from brothels, and so all monasteries fell into ill repute, even the innocent, like our own at Tynemouth. I closed my eyes to all these things, seeking consolation in our own band of brothers and trying to forget the rest. But the omens would not let us forget. Thunderstorm followed thunderstorm in the very midst of winter. Hailstones fell as big as men's fists and fiery dragons were seen flying overhead. A lamb with two heads was born out of season at Whitley and boats were seen out at sea in in the mist sailing against the wind. Many wondered if the end of the world was coming. I took to walking around around our states daily to see if all were well. The exercise kept my mind from brooding. One night, late in January, I found myself at our furthest village, the one called Priestun, or Priest's Fort. While I was talking to the steward, A sudden cry from the watchtower brought us all running to the ramparts. A small party were approaching slowly and carrying a long, heavy load on their shoulders. A funeral at this time of night? Who's died? I shook my head, for I had the illusion that the distant men were not villagers but monks. I didn't know whether to blame the state of my eyes or the state of my mind. They're priests, black priests, a man shouted hysterically. Priests come to bury a priest. At that, 
My eyes focused as if by miracle. I saw 13 monks, saw fear and defeat in the droop of their shoulders, in the mud on their habits. I saw the jeweled cross carried one-handed, head down and plastered with clay. I saw the clay on the jeweled coffin and I knew something terrible had happened at Lindisfarne. I pulled the gate bars down myself and ran to meet them. They laid down the casket reverently and collapsed in the dirt of the road. I recognised their leader, Edmund the Sacristan of Holy Island. The others were all ordinary brothers. Edmund, what are you doing here? Where's Prior John? Dead? And the abbot, the sub-prior, dead? All dead? What, of the plague? Worse, we would not have fled for plague. It was Vikings. I stared stupidly. Are you sure? I was there. Six dragon ships with striped sails. They cut down the abbot on the high altar. We were at mass. I couldn't believe it. Lindisfarne has been our safe place since Northumbria was a kingdom. The sons of Eda fled thither from the British. Cadwallon could not conquer it, nor the murderous Pender. Besides, it was protected by the bones of all the saints, Aidan, Oswald and Cuthbert. And it sat within five miles of the royal capital of Bambra, with its thousand warriors and the Northumbrian fleet drawn up on the beach. The king's watchman overlooked it night and day. The king! Edmund shook his head wearily. The ships from Bambra had to row against the wind. They came too late. Cuthbert? Edmund gestured towards the casket and spoke in low tones, as if something dwelt therein. Something living dwelt therein. We bear him with us, and the head of Aidan, and the hand of Oswald Fairhand. He will no longer stay on Lindisfarne. He comes to us in visions when we sleep, and drives us on southward. We at Tynemouth would be honoured. Edmund gave me a raw smile. Nothing would suit us better, Brother Prior, but there is no arguing with him. Did the Norsemen take the casket? They tried to prise it open, but their leader fell dead in a fit. That was when they left, setting fire to the buildings. I was lying, feigning death nearby, and saw it all. The Vikings will hold. We Northumbrians in scorn now. No one is safe. We will be next. You have your problem, brother. We gave them lodging for the night, and the next day they left for the ford at the Tyne, for the ford of the Tyne at Monkchester. All that year, the Northmen did not return. There were those who preferred to forget Lindisfarne, but I was not one. I persuaded King Athelred to set a coast watch with fast horses, so we should have warning. I repaired the ditch and stockade across the narrow neck of Penbraukrag. I took every man and young boy from among my people and trained them to fight, to enlarge my war band of Frid. Women and children tilled the fields alone that year, and many were hungry, especially as the following winter was bitter and hard, and all our charity money had gone on new spears and shields. For what greater charity is there than to kill the murder murderous heathen? My monks had all been warriors before they took the vow, and such they became again. Chastity and obedience are as much becoming to warriors as to monks. I arranged a speedy way of gathering my scattered army from the farms when the Vikings came. I would send monks out with the war arrow to the nearer farms. If the farmer was there, they gave it to him. If he was away, it was left sticking in the ground by his door. Then the arrow was carried by that farmer to his neighbour and so on to the ends of our estate. Then all would run to the stockade. As I said before, the winter was bitterly cold and we had to keep great fires of logs burning which filled the hall with smoke and stung the eyes. When it was over, when the ice on the tyne broke and the swallows came flying back from over the sea, I was not surprised to see the coast watch messenger come galloping into the courtyard on a blown horse. The striped sails had been sighted, sailing down the coast from Bambra. The war arrow went round. Then there was nothing else to do but wait. So I held a shortened service of nonnes. My brothers looked odd, chanting their responses in chainmail. They were excited and it was hard to slow the service down to a decent pace. You can with difficulty teach Saxons how to love God. Love of a fight comes to them with their mother's milk. I thought that the Norse war leader might be a fool. When he finally came in view, he would have been sailing in sight of the coast for 40 miles. Didn't he know a horse can gallop faster than a ship can sail? Perhaps in Norway the coast is too rocky for a horse to gallop along. 
The Fred and the people came hurrying in their hundreds with cattle and horses, food and bedding. We made them lie within the stockade where they could not be observed from the sea. I made the Taimath villagers walk among their huts and keep their fires burning as if all were normal. It was possible that this Viking might be such a fool that he would think he had caught us by surprise, as at Lindisfarne. If he thought this, we might catch him in a trap. You see, there are two landing beaches at Tymouth, one, of e- one on either side of our crag. The northerly one is backed by steep cliffs, the southerly one by gentle slopes. He would not see the southerly one until he had sailed past the crag. If he thought he had achieved surprise, he might risk landing on the north beach, and then we could line the cliffs and kill him at our leisure. On the other hand, we had not enough men to hold the gentle southern slopes, and we would lose at least the village if he came that way. We counted the striped sails from the church tower as they came into view. There were twenty of them. My heart sank. A dragon ship can carry sixty warriors. We were outnumbered three to one. We could not hold that number, even behind our stockade, for more than half a day. Only on the cliffs of the North Bay could we hold them, or twice their number. Silently, the great fleet approached, turning neither left nor right, but still heading straight for the crag. It was a clear day with a blue sea and a gentle northeast wind. We could see the great dragon heads painted blue and red, the rows of gleaming shields along their ship's sides, and the glitter on the horn helmets and weapons. Soon they must turn, or they would come into the rocks at the bottom of our crag. Pray, brothers, pray. Pray that God will make them mad. My hands hold my beads, but my mind could think of nothing but battle. End of part one. Part two. At the last moment, the fleet split Right ship steered for the North Bay, and the rest turned away round the headland with a flurry of oars. The worst had happened. Now, if we defended the North Cliffs, the greater forces would take us in the rear. But if we did not defend the North Cliffs, our stick stockade would fall anyway. Was ever such a decision to be made? Defend the North, I said, and it was not I, shaking like a leaf, but a stranger who said it. We were in the hands of the Lord. I watched the Frid spilling out through the stockade as the first dragon head grounded on the North Bay. I saw the first Vikings leap ashore. They were huge and stripped to a leather breechcloth, so they all seemed flesh and metal. Many had beards and hair that fell to their waists. A strong rancid stench blew upwards to my nostrils. I had not smelt them before. They ran towards the cliff foot, yelling horribly. I saw our first arrows fly, glinting in the sunlight. And one of the heathen fell on his face and ceased to move. I confess I felt joy. At least they were mortal men who were subject to death. Then I had no time to watch the battle, for the other part of the fleet was entering the Tyne. I prayed again. These ships looked, these ships looked so, small, so small and far off, yet if they steered the ill way for us, I and all my people would be dead before the sun moved a hand's breadth in the sky. Men in the Viking ships were pointing up the river. I looked where they pointed and saw our sister monastery at Jarrow lying peaceful in the sunlight with royal ships at anchor in the slake below. The twelve ships headed straight for them, ignoring us completely. I shall never know why. Perhaps they always meant to split their forces and attack Jarrow. Perhaps the Lord did make them mad, or perhaps being Vikings, they could think of nothing but what was immediately before their eyes, like children. I have heard since that they are better at fighting than thinking, and very hard to command in battle. When their sails had grown small against the glitter of the distant water, I posted a watchman and left the tower. They could not turn and row back against the wind inside the hour, so we should have ample warning of their return. I could tell things were going well for us before I reached the North Cliffs. Saxons make a merry home when they are winning a battle, like a housewife at her spinning wheel when the wool runs true. There was much shouting about being Edringers. My name is Edric. I must tell them soon that they are not my warriors, but gods. It was all rather simple. 
The Vikings either stood on the beach trying to defend themselves with their round shields against the hail of arrows, spears and rocks that descended on their heads, or else they would try to climb the cliffs, which meant that they reached our shield wall out of breath. Their hands were too occupied with handholds to use their weapons properly. Properly, If they kept their handholds, they were, they were quickly speared and fell down upon their comrades, carrying others to their deaths. If they released their handholds to fight better, the least pressure on their shields knocked them over backwards with the same effect. Quite a lot were dying as they stood on the beach too. They hadn't had the least chance of winning the battle or even harming us seriously. So far, we had suffered two losses. One man had fallen down the cliff through over-enthusiasm and another had had a foot severed by a lucky sword blow. They are vicious brutes, these Vikings, a head taller than our own men and carrying swords of a size we could not wield. Their one desire is to make a reputation by murdering and plundering before dying sword in hand and going to their drunken heaven, which they call Valhalla. But each man fights alone as if his comrades didn't exist and so they were no match for our disciplined shield wall. A panting servant tugged at my arm and pointed back at the tower. I ran back to it like the wind, fearing the other enemies were returning from Jarrow. Instead, I saw a dreadful sight. The monastery across the river was in flames. The famous library where the venerable Bede had worked was no more. Our Anglo-Saxon boats seemed to have escaped and were lying motionless further upstream. I cried in anguish, Why has God allowed this? The servant pointed to the east. The light was darkening and a heavy cloud was drawing towards the land, trailing shadows of rain beneath. The wind blew colder and much stronger. There's a squall coming up. The Vikings were re-embarking. I saw the sails unfurled. They began to put out in the slake. As they did so, the fury of the squall hurled itself onto them and onto us. It became near as dark as midnight. In the flare of lightning, I saw the pirate ships heel over as they hit the sandbanks with which the slake is dotted. Boat after boat capsized. Only seven reached the main channel of the river with sails hauled down and oars flailing. The wind was so strong, I had to cling to the tower parapet for dear life. Now the Royal Saxon boats, seeing their chance, were moving in to attack. As the battle moved towards us, I remembered the fighting in the North Bay. If the Jarrow Vikings landed in our area, we could still be beaten. I ran back. Little had changed. We had lost three more men, but a lot more Viking bodies lay at the cliff's foot. The remainder were wrestling with their ships, which, caught by the squall, had been swung round sideways to the shore. We We had to get rid of them quickly. Bring fire arrows quickly. They fetched some, their points fringed with oil soaked cloth. The squall was dying down. There was no time to lose. A hail of arrows swept down on the longships, some of them trailing clouds of smoke. More Norsemen fell, and one of their sails exploded into flames. The ropes holding up the spar on the mast burnt through, and the flaming mass fell on the deck. Instantly, the whole ship was alight. Then the same thing happened again. It was enough to break their resistance. I could not but admire the way they got the other boats out to sea. Only one tangled with its burning neighbour and was lost. All the living foe escaped. I ran back again to my tower. The river battle was approaching our headland. Some of my men had climbed down to the north beach to stupidly exalt the dead, but I quickly recalled them behind the stockade. Now there were six Viking ships left. The other lay capsized on a river, on a river sandbar. Men were swimming ashore from it to our side of the river. Our Northumbrian boats clung tight to the other raiders, and I saw the occasional arrow fly. Then, as the two depleted Viking fleets came in sight of each other round the cliff, the Northumbrian ships fell back outnumbered. We sat behind our stockade and wondered what the Vikings would do next. They had lost nearly half their ships and nearly half their men. Perhaps the survivors of the North Bay had overestimated our numbers. Our shallower bay was now guarded by Northumbrian ships. They thought better of continuing the fight and sailed away. No sooner had we drawn breath than a terrified fisherman ran up to say the Vikings were murdering and raping in the North Shields, a group of fishermen's huts on the riverbank. As he spoke, they went up in flames. 
These were the Vikings who had swum ashore from the ship on the sandbar. I took no chances. I took the whole freight and marched down, keeping up a shield wall all the way. When we reached the shields, the scene was foul. A dying child told us the pirates had fled down the shore to the river mouth. There, on the beach called the Haven, we cornered them. I got my men in a ring, four spears deep. Some were for engaging the foe in single combat, but I was determined that none more of my people should die. Slowly we hemmed them and forced them into the water. There they flung themselves on our spears in a last attack. They were only 20 in number, but they took a long time to kill. And in the end, I did lose two more men. I think they became mad in the end, what they themselves called berserk. They dedicated themselves to their father, Odin, foamed at the mouth and charged like bulls. Sometimes they bore down a dozen spears with the weight of their bodies. It seemed more of a hunting of strange sea beasts than a fight with men. We made very sure they were finally dead. When all was finished, I stood and stared at the bodies as the waves washed over them, wondering if Vikings were human at all and whether they will return. I think not. They lost many of their chiefs in the two battles, including the king Ragnar Lodbrok, who was captured alive and whom King Ethelred threw bound into a pit of vipers. My men have flayed the Viking corpses and nailed their skins to their doors to dry. It is not a practice I approve of, but one cannot change human nature overnight. These Northumbrians are still half heathen themselves. Praised be to God.